Nietzsche's proclamation of the death of God marks the beginning of the modern age, the age in which science and technology have largely replaced religion as the bodies of knowledge and the activities that society depends on and lives by. At least one traditional understanding of what God means was at an end. Yet the theme wasn't novel. As we've seen, it's been building up for centuries. Even as far back as Galileo, the idea was already coming in that the way the world works is neither moral nor purposive, but simply mechanical. A mechanical universe no longer reveals any guiding hand at work in it. So the new secular scientific worldview cannot give the old kind of support to religious belief. It seems that faith must be separated from cosmology, our theory of the world, and become more inward and ethical. As we've seen in this series, many Christian thinkers have been attempting just that. Pascal turned away from the objective God of the philosophers and sought a new way to a hidden God known by the heart. Kierkegaard sought to keep God's transcendence but within the sphere of the spiritual life. Jung's God was an image buried deep in the psyche of the whole self that we are to become. Albert Schweitzer's God was an ethical inspiration, the ground of the will to love. These thinkers were moving away from the old cosmic, literal theism. Instead, they saw God as hidden in the heart, by which they meant, perhaps, as the soul's guiding ideal. A new idea of God has been slowly taking shape, but perhaps nobody yet had managed to spell it out entirely satisfactorily. Well, we've one more thinker still to meet, as remarkable a character as perhaps anyone else in this series. In the autumn of 1908, he came here to Manchester University's Aeronautical Engineering Laboratory. He was 19 years old, and his name was Ludwig Wittgenstein. He was an impulsive, sociable character, at that time still very well-to-do. He was highly musical. He made many friends. But he didn't have much to say about his exotic background. Wittgenstein was a product of Vienna in the last days of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. His father was its leading steel magnate. The nine talented children grew up in surroundings of the utmost opulence. But they belonged to a new generation which rejected this high bourgeois culture, preferring modernism in art, puritanism in morals, and truth and simplicity in all things. This outlook shows in Wittgenstein's early choice of engineering as an honest profession. In Manchester, he designed and then began to build a jet reaction engine that would deliver the thrust at the tip of the blades. Over 30 years later, aircraft such as the Fairy Gyrodyne were built on this principle. But 1910 was too early. And in any case, Wittgenstein's life was about to change. To design his propeller, he needed mathematics. Now, any ordinary mathematician just does mathematics, but Wittgenstein asked himself the fatal question, what is mathematics? Why is it so powerful? And what are numbers? Wittgenstein was the sort of man who quite unselfconsciously goes straight to the top. By the autumn of 1911, he'd found out who was the best philosopher of mathematics alive. And he simply presented himself as a student to Bertrand Russell at Cambridge. He was queer, and his notions seemed to me odd. He came to me and said, will you please tell me whether I am a complete idiot or not? Because if I am a complete idiot, I shall become an aeronaut. But if not, I shall become a philosopher. I told him to write me something during the vacation on some philosophical subject. After reading only one sentence, I said to him, no, you must not become an aeronaut. Although Wittgenstein spent so many years in Cambridge, he was never at ease with the clannish, ritualistic and enclosed side of academic life. In fact, he thought it corrupt and much preferred the town to the gown. 
Like Nietzsche, he had a great need for freedom. He never married nor owned a house. He liked to live in digs, which he kept changing. And he frequently vanished altogether. When war broke out, he volunteered for the Austrian army. Now I should have the chance to be a decent human being, for I'm standing eye to eye with death. May the spirit bring me light. Understand people. Whenever you feel like hating them, try instead to understand them. Be at peace within yourself. But how do you find this peace in yourself? Only if I live in a way pleasing to God. Only so can one bear life. The war destroyed the world Wittgenstein had grown up in. His life changed. He gave away his money and became a country school teacher in Austria. At the same time, he published the Tractatus Logico Philosophicus. This famous book is the last great attempt to defend the traditional view that language can copy reality precisely and completely. What can be said can be said clearly. What cannot be said clearly is not in the world, and one must be silent about it. When a few years later Wittgenstein designed and built this house for his sister, he gave his teaching visible form. Wittgenstein's approach to architecture was stringently functional. Everything had to be redesigned for the utmost simplicity, right down to this window latch, then precision engineered. And the result is not inhuman. Windows and doors match the shape of the human body. They're double for silence and insulation, and there are heating grills below them. The whole thing is exact and spare and sublime, like Wittgenstein's philosophy. And as with his philosophy, What's left out is even more important than what's left in. The sense of the world must lie outside the world. In the world, everything is as it is, and everything happens as it does happen. In it, no value exists. God does not reveal himself in the world, feeling the world as a limited whole. It is this that is mystical. What did Wittgenstein mean by God in his early philosophy? The house gives a clue. After a while, the geometrical tranquility of this place begins to remind us of a mosque, a place where God is so exalted and transcendent that no image at all is possible. Can you imagine an idea of God so exalted that the sense of the presence of God and the sense of the absence of God coincide. Or put it another way, by its extreme rigor, the house creates a sense, it gives a hint of an absolute standard of purity by which human life should be guided and assessed. Wittgenstein once said he liked the idea of a silent religion. Silence tells no lies. Silence does not deceive. We feel that even when all possible scientific questions have been answered, the problems of life remain completely untouched. Of course, there are then no questions left, and this itself is the answer. The solution of the problem of life is seen in the vanishing of the problem. What we cannot speak about, we must pass over in silence. In 1929, 40 years old now, Wittgenstein unexpectedly reappeared in Cambridge after a 16-year absence and soon began teaching. From 1933, word went round that in his classes in Trinity College, he was developing an entirely new philosophy. The classes were held in this room at the head of K Staircase in Hewell's Court. By the window, his writing table. The shoe boxes in which his notes were stored and the deck chair in which he habitually sat. The austerity and bareness of the room 
which was his own living room as well as his teaching room, reflects his Tolstoyan personality and style of life. As each student arrived, he or she collected a wooden folding chair from the landing outside. It was unwise to be late. The class met twice a week for a grueling two-hour session. We know Wittgenstein planned these sessions carefully because the published students' notes of them tally with his own unpublished manuscripts. But during the class, Wittgenstein thought aloud and occasionally terrified the students by questioning them. What is philosophy? Here's an example. Every day we ask each other the time and answer without any hesitation. But suppose one day we ask ourselves, what is time? Now we suddenly seem to be landed with a genuine classical philosophical problem, a very difficult one. Wittgenstein says that these problems arise through a disease of language. A myth has held us captive. We're caught up in the idea that words are names and that the meaning of a word is the thing that it stands for. And then we start investigating what that thing can possibly be. Wittgenstein had himself held such a view, but now he was trying to shake it off. Instead, he asks us to see words as doing jobs, words are tools of many different kinds. Words are like chess pieces. The meaning of a piece is its powers, the part it can play in furthering the game. Well, all language is like that. We play games with language. Our language is a function of the way we live. It's a tool of social interaction. Now, this may sound rather abstract, but in fact, it changes everything. The old theory of meaning summoned up great nebulous abstractions which philosophers then worried about. But Wittgenstein's new point of view is strictly practical. Look at the grammar, he says. Look at the way the language works. If only you can see that clearly, you'll see all there is to see. Look at the grammar of ethical terms, and such terms as God, soul, mind. One of the chief troubles is that we take a substantive to correspond to a thing. The words soul and mind have been used as though they stood for a thing, a gaseous thing. What is the soul is a misleading question. So what